Are you ready for the next natural disaster or any other major calamity? Are you able to have clean running water when the power is out? Are you able to keep your family fed for an extended period of time without going to the store? Are you able to heat your home when the utilities aren't working? If you answered no to any of these questions, you need to come to the Sustainable Preparedness Expo on Sunday, May 15th at the Spokane County Fairgrounds in Spokane, Washington from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. There will be multiple seminar presentations on topics like disaster preparedness, wilderness survival, preparing for emergency medical and dental situations, water well hand pumps, fire management on the homestead, permaculture gardening to feed your family year-round, emergency communications, food preservation, making a living on your homestead, and many more practical sessions on preparing for whatever may come. Sign up for hands-on classes to learn emergency surtering, emergency dental procedures, and how to prepare a bug-out bag. In addition, there will be top-quality items available from dozens of vendors to assist you in meeting your preparation needs. We are bringing in expert presenters and vendors from around the country who will be able to answer your questions about preparedness. Admission is only $12 per person. Kids 12 and under are free. For more information, go to susprepexpo.com. That's S-U-S prepexpo.com. Come to the Spokane County Fairgrounds on Sunday, May 15th at 10 a.m. for the Sustainable Preparedness Expo, where you can learn the practice of perpetual preparedness. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, which can be found on our website at treyerwilderness.com and also on iTunes. Welcome to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where we are homesteading traditionally 100% off-grid today and offering preparedness and survival tips for tomorrow. Here's your host, Tammy Treyer. Welcome and thanks so much for joining me here on Mountain Woman Radio. I'm so glad to have you. We are headed heavily into spring and summer here. Really excited. As I mentioned last week, my garden is not going to be what it was last year, but things are coming up. I have some volunteer seeds that have started growing, which is really making me quite happy. And we have been out walking and have found our morel mushrooms. So excited to get out and do a lot of morelling this year. Hopefully we can get enough that we can dry some. Typically, we get them and we just hog them down. So they're the wild steak of the wilderness. So if you haven't gone morel hunting, I highly encourage it. Today, I am really excited to have some awesome guests on. I actually have a husband and wife team with me today, which is awesome. And I know you guys will enjoy them. They are from SwissHillsFerments.com. I have Karen and James Christian joining me. And uh, they are a wealth of information, and I know that this will really excite many of you. So without further ado, Karen and James, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much. We're really excited to be here. Yeah, this is, this is great. This is awesome. Awesome. Well, you guys have a wonderful website, which is also a wealth of information on so many topics. So I figure what I would do is open the floor up and let you guys kind of share your story, how you got started with what you're doing. Sure. Um, so, gosh, we have tried so many different fermentation pro projects. You know, we've been doing making cheese and yogurt and trekking meat, salami, um, pickles, I don't know, brewing beer. Lots of things. So for us, we sort of, um, about five years ago, we started making cheese. I had a friend who kind of taught herself from a book, and she helped me start the same journey. And then little by little, we sort of been building on that and just adding all of these different things that we're interested in. Do you want to? Yeah, well, yeah, and then building off of that, one of my good buddies actually took me out and taught me how to uh, slaughter my first pig. <laughs> and 
so I had about three three uh, hundred pounds of uh, pig that I had to process to figure out what to do with, and we got into uh, meat processing, and then went into sausage charcuterie, and then another friend of mine started uh, brewing beer, and I learned that from him too. So now we've got beer brewing in our house as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we just kind of been adding things, and you know, I was thinking back, and you know, even since James and I've been dating, we've been in the kitchen making things if it wasn't fermenting just you know that was our way to connect was to to find interesting recipes to start and um so we've been we've been doing that for quite a while um and uh, it's just, it just tastes good you know it's, yeah. we fell naturally into it it's fun yep. we like doing it we like sharing it with other people our friends our family Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think it's I think it's making a revival. A lot of a lot of my my buddies and peers in in the neighborhood and the community that we live in, they're all very interested in it, and they're all all want to know how to do it. Which yeah. yep. I don't know. I, I think it's a nationwide thing, which is really neat to see. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. really awesome to see things coming back. I totally agree with you. And as with what we do here, in my mind what you guys are doing is really imperative for us all to learn because of the uncertainties of our society and world at this time. You know, being able to um, ferment things and store our foods and uh, cure our meats is a huge, huge thing for self-sufficiency. And I think that, you know, so many things have been lost in in culture as we've progressed and those things that we've lost are the things that are going to save us so I think it's really important for us to learn all these skills and that's why when I went to your website I was just like enthralled because you really give a lot of detailed information and like I said to you before we started recording this is stuff we love to do. I love making cheese and I love making yogurt. And there's just something to be said about being in the kitchen and, and or even, you know, in the butcher shop and, and being able to see the works of your labor and the love of your labor. And then, like you said, to be able to do it together as a team. My husband and I love doing stuff, you know, from hunting to butchering to processing the meats you know we do that as a family and do that together so it's been something we've taught our son too so passing down the knowledge is huge and you guys are doing your your share of that with your website and and getting the word out so i think that's awesome yeah i mean i think we're you know as as these older generations are you know passing away you know we're losing more and more of that you know i'm trying to glean as much as i can from my my own grandpa Yep. And, you know, uh, my grandma's already gone, and Karen's, a lot of her grandparents are already gone. I, you know, we're losing a lot of that yep. tradition. And, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to get as much as we can. Yeah. You know, yeah, and our, our, ta- our tagline for Swiss Hills Farmers is bringing back traditions. And that's, you know, that's really important to us because a lot of these things used to be common knowledge. And now it's like we found ourselves, we... Um, we're having to dig deep to find this information. It's not something that our parents know. It's not something that a lot of our friends know, and we're having to relearn it all. And we want to, you know, we really want to help make it easier for other people to to learn this stuff, too. We think that's important. Yeah. I mean, building off what we said earlier, I mean, everybody's interested in this. I, I'm try- I was trying to uh, research this a little while back as far as, why we, we're seeing this resurgence in, in homesteading or crafting, whether it's knife making, blacksmithing, food, yep. et cetera. And it seems like as our society is racing forward with technology, you're sitting at the desk all day, you know, crunching numbers, and you really don't have any substance to really show from that. Yep. And so it's, it's, you need something, whether it's food, whether it's... <laughs> Woodworking, whether it's blacksmithing, I really don't. I really don't care as long as you have some joy or pleasure in life. Yep. You know that's that's the that's the amazing thing that we want to yep. push on to people. Yeah, and that's so true. That's so so true because you kind of everybody feels like they're in a lull and and in a valley because there's really you know you you have to work so hard to own the homes you have that you don't get to stay in you know so it's having some sort of simple pleasure out of life is key you know so that you're not just in that hamster wheel running the rat race like everybody else and that's what led us to living off the grid is just the the desire to have a freedom 
uh, away from everything else and to kind of create our own lifestyle. You know, we we love the simplicity of um, the traditional skills and kind of also feel like we were born like maybe 200 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I like modern medicine, though. I do like modern medicine. So. I, I do, too, to agree, uh, to a degree right now. With what I'm going through, I'm very thankful for the uh, alternative side of things, too. But, yes, it's oh. nice to know that it's still there and that we have it for those emergencies because it certainly does play a role. <laughs> and my girlfriend yeah. would tell you that Running water is a necessity, also. <laughs> yeah, good yeah, point. Nice. Modern plumbing, yes. <laughs> yeah. But these are all such good points, and it's and and there is a big um, return of all these things because I think people are seeing where we're headed and and knowing that you know there's there's uh, ways to do things aside from the modern way that will. Like like uh, preserving cheese in in wax and and giving it a long life, where currently our only options are either freezer or eat it fast kind of deal, you know. So there there are ways that our ancestors did things that are really wise and and will really uh, bring us into the you know into our future if we learn these skills. So what are some of your favorite things that you guys do? Well. My favorite, my very favorite is to make triple cream brie. Okay. Um, it's a it's a mold ripened cheese, so it's one of those cheeses that's covered in the white mold, okay. uh, penicillin candidum, and it softens a little bit in the interior, so it doesn't get quite as gooey as some of your other brie cheeses okay. because it has so much cream in it. Okay. But it is amazing. <laughs> that is my favorite. But not only not only is it my favorite to eat, and um, but it's also really easy to make. And there are, um, I'm not sure what types of cheeses you make, but there are a lot of cheeses where you kind of have to, you know, sit over your, your milk and stir it and bring it gradually up to temperature and just babysit it quite a bit. Right. And triple cream is one of those where, you know, you... You bring it up to temperature, and you add some things. You know, add your cheese cultures and run it, and then you wait a whole day. So you know, you only spent you know ten minutes maybe doing that, and then the next day you cut the curds and you start draining it, and you wait a whole another day, um, and then you know, flip your cheeses and salt them. And I mean, it. I like the things that don't require a lot of hands-on time. I guess. Okay. <laughs> we, well, we also have. We also have three kids, so... <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, yeah, my my cheese making has been um, much more so oriented toward the things that are easy to do these days. So that's what I've been doing, and then you stick them... Yeah, well, the difficult thing is you have to find a way to age it. But um, as long as you can find a way to age your cheese, making triple cream is one of the easiest ones I think you can make, and it, my favorite tastes so good. So. Oh, nice, nice. Now, does, does your house look like a science project going on all over the place? Since you said you have beer sitting in places uh, too, <laughs> there are jars all over every counter of our house <laughs> right now. It, 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 it's true. I once had someone stop at our house to to drop something off, and I didn't know her very well. And she said, what's that over there? What's that? What's that? <laughs> and so I was telling all of my projects, and for the first time, I was like. No, it might seem strange to someone else that we've got all these different <laughs> jars and ferments and everything going on. But what do we even have in this? We have a couple of vinegars that we're fermenting and making right now. We've got soy sauce <laughs> going in the kitchen. Yeah, we, we just got things all over the place. Yeah, uh, that's just what I can see right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, we can relate. I've got two big uh, gallon jugs of kombucha going, and I've often got the vegetables with the airlocks on the counter fermenting either radishes or zucchini or green beans or something. So, yeah, and vinegar is another good one. I love vinegar. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, do you guys share your recipes as well? Like, is your brie recipe on, on your website? Yes. Okay. All of our recipes are, are on our website. We have a really good resource of, you know, cheese-making recipes and um, dry-cured meats and fermented vegetables, condiments. Uh, I'm trying to think what else we have. Um, and we also have tutorials. So if you've never made cheese before, we have tutorials for how to... Um, 
you know, how to make cheese and how to brew beer and things like that. And then on, on the blog that we run, we also have all, all the things you can make with these ferments. So we've got, you know, recipes for, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I can't even think. We, we just, I just put up a, a recipe for some Korean tacos that they um, fermented, um, chili paste called gochujang, and I don't know, like all these things. We've got recipes and tutorials and all that. We, yeah, we've got a lot. We're trying to hit the variety. You yeah. know, we're not trying to put well, just beer, just cheese. <laughs> right. Trying to try to hit the smorgasbord sport of everything. Good well, there's you. just so many things that you can ferment, but I don't yes. know. It's, yeah, and so many things to try. Yeah, exactly. And use the ferments for and which brings up the topic of from scratch cooking, which is also good because we need to step back into that arena too. Because our processed foods are just so toxic. So the, you, I will put links as always in the show notes for especially for the triple cream brie cheese, but uh, links to your website. And as far as the tutorials, do you guys also do video tutorials as well? Not yet. We okay. want to get into that. We, we we realize that some people just can't read something and get it immediately. I, I'm personally one of those guys that wants to watch a video first. Right. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and learn that way. Okay. And, and we want to go that route, but we just need to, we, we need to uh, gather up a more equipment yeah. to make that happen a little bit easier. Totally understand. <laughs> totally understand. And actually, it's probably a good thing that you're slowly venturing into that because when you have your hand in too many pots at one time, like we did there for a while, it kind of makes you go stir crazy for a while. There's so many avenues to reach people, but everybody, like you said, everybody does have different learning abilities and, and preferences. So I just thought I'd, I'd ask that. Now, James, what are some of your favorite things to do? Uh, well, I like I like the meat side of the house more. Um, I'm getting more into hunting. Uh, we live in Arizona, so it, it, hunting it's a little difficult. And some people here in Arizona might correct me a little bit, but I, I think it's a little difficult to get uh, hunting tags versus maybe up north. The uh, the environment around here uh, there's not as many animals, okay. and so they restrict tags a little bit more on you so I'm trying to do it okay. but uh, and I've got a lot of money to do but uh, I really want to get into that area but I like I like butchery I like uh, beef I like butchering cows and pigs okay. I really think also you know when it comes to that when you have 300 pounds and you're just throwing that into a, a deep freezer right you know and you you know you put your I don't know, frozen green peas on top of the top of a leg of pork and then you've got your you know, your frozen pizzas on top of that and suddenly, you know, six months goes by to a year goes by and suddenly you pull out, you know, five pounds, ten pounds of meat in the bottom of this thing, you're like, Oh it's all you know, it's all freezer burned. Yeah. I would rather when you when you put something in the freezer, it's not gonna taste as good as when you butchered it that day. Right. You know, when you harvest that deer that day, it tastes amazing. Same with the cow, same with the pig. You know, in the freezer, it slowly degrades and tastes over time and quality. Yeah. I would rather be able to ferment and dry cure something, and then the taste goes from good to great over time, you know. And mm -hmm. it's not going to look pretty, you know. It's going to have mold and, you know, other things growing on it. And, it, you know, it might smell a little funky and barnyardish, but when you cut into something and it's, it's done in six months to a year or a month, depending on how, what you're making. Right. And it tastes amazing. And you, you know that you made that. I mean, I'd rather do that than just throwing a chunk of meat in the, the freezer. So that's how it naturally progressed from butchering, hunting to charcuterie to sausage making. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, yeah. I, I have more questions. I'm going to take a short break to um, hear some words from our sponsors and I'll come back with a bunch of questions for you on that. So just stay tuned. Are you a blogger or author struggling to keep up with the demands of your business? Are you also afraid to hire somebody on in fear of that inadequate person and the struggles that go along with it? Well, look no further. Contact Michelle of mdh-services.com for a reliable, efficient, and trustworthy virtual assistant. Offering editing, manuscript editing, blog post creation, blog work, administrative work, clerical work, 
social media sharing, and so much more. She's very organized, efficient, and she will always be a step ahead of you. Trust me. So contact Michelle of mdh-services.com and take your blog and writing to the next level. Do you have a loved one or are you suffering from celiac disease or a gluten intolerance? Trying to find that perfect flour? Whether you are baking cookies, flaky pie crust, or baking breads from scratch, or you are looking for a quick cake from a package, look no further. Better Batter offers non-GMO gluten-free products with an assortment of packaged items, as well as flour packaged in varying sizes, including their bulk sizes, perfect for those of you that are practicing your preparedness skills. Better Batter is not just another gluten-free flour. It's what you have been searching for. Visit betterbatter.org. Do you have your free digital subscription to Prepare Magazine yet? If not, then hurry over to preparemag.com and start getting each monthly issue sent directly to your inbox. It's easy. All you have to do is go to preparemag.com, enter your name and email address, and you're subscribed. Consider signing up for the premium membership for past issues and exclusive resources. You can even subscribe to the beautiful print version of Prepare Magazine. Visit preparemag.com and choose the option that's most valuable to you. Prepare Magazine, encouraging, empowering, and enriching your journey. Okay, we are back, and we are speaking with Karen and James from SwissHillsFerments.com. And uh, James was just sharing how he enjoys working and butchering the meats and working with the meats. And uh, his his decision to uh, ferment his meats rather than to freeze. And I have to agree, uh, we have a, a very small propane freezer out here, and we do we put moose in there three years ago and had it puzzle piece in there and it was we go through meat very fast my men are huge eaters so I do get your point about it you know five months down the road but my guys oh my word I used to be able to make a roast and have leftovers for a whole week I don't even have leftovers from a roast anymore I mean they just they're they're hounds and they're meat hounds so so we the the moose meat was some of the most amazing meat we've ever had but because the moose filled the freezer we had elk and deer meat that needed to be processed so I canned it and that was just beyond amazing and, and stepped me up to another uh, mindset as far as being able to pull it off the shelf and always having it and it not going bad. But then we also uh, smoke our meats as well and do jerky. And to me, I grew up um, in Pennsylvania Dutch country so with, with uh, Pennsylvania Dutch heritage. So everything was smoked and to get out here into Idaho and nobody smoked their meats. They couldn't find a smoked ham. You couldn't find, a, a, you could find it in the grocery store, but there's no comparison to getting it from a butcher shop or fresh. Like you said, I mean, when we would butcher the steers, you know, we, while we were butchering, we'd throw some big steaks on the grill while we were, you know, processing the meat. There's nothing better than having that fresh meat. So I totally get what you're saying. And then you also do salt curing, correct? Yeah, well, we've done, um, well, we've done, you know, any of your wet curing, we've done, you know, we've made bacon and we've made hams um, and things like that, uh, but we also have done dry curing, which involves salting your meat, you know, putting some spices on it, and then you leave it in the fridge for a few days, um, and then after that, you need to find a, a place to hang it to let it dry out, and um that type that really helps to preserve it and last quite a while. The trick is finding a place that has the right conditions. So to, to dry cure meat and to hang it, um, you need something that's about, um, well, maybe around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, about 70% humidity. For us, we did not have those conditions in our house. Yeah. So that was actually the the inspiration that we had for starting our business um, was coming up with a, a chamber, a way to make a, a place that could house us, that give us the conditions, right, temperature and humidity and airflow um, to dry these meats. Um, and in the process, we could use it also for, you know, aging cheeses and things like that. Um, but that, that was our inspiration was our need. And from that, we came up with um, this product that we're calling the cave. Do you want to? Yeah, so so cave is, is a is a unit on top of a, um, a freezer or a refrigerator. Okay. Um, you drill a hole in the top of it, and you 
you uh, put this this cave on top, and you it's got monitors, sensors, as well as a heating unit and a fan okay. inside this in this structure, this unit on top. And you set you're able to set your conditions, um, and it's able to through these sensors monitor your temperature inside the chamber, and turn on your refrigerator to cool or turn on the heater, which is inside the unit, to heat it up. So it's able to really precisely control your temperature. Okay. And you can also plug in a humidifier into this unit as well, and it'll turn that on and off to hold humidity inside your chambers um, within, I, I believe, yeah, one to two percentage points, plus or minus. Okay. Um, so it, it, it'll, it'll regulate your environment to create optimal conditions for, for your cheese, sausage, whole meats, uh, beer. A lot of guys down here just throw their beer into the closet and <laughs> temperature fluctuations happen and you start getting off off flavors in your beer. So this will help with that as well, which is which is awesome. Yeah, no. yeah, we designed it to be as versatile as possible so you can do a lot of projects with it, but also um, uh, you you can take the unit and put it on um, whatever refrigerator or freezer size you have so that you can either have a small chamber for something really small or if you've got a lot of stuff going on, you can... You can, you can expand it up. Yeah. yeah, whatever size you have, it'll it'll be able to be utilized for that, which is nice. Yeah, or it's versatile. Yeah, very awesome. Very awesome. And you p had a good point because, you know, there's so many different climates. You know, we have a lot of rain in spring and fall, so it gets a lot damp and sometimes too moist to do certain things. So uh, that's a really good point. And I imagine in Arizona, it's probably too dry and you don't have enough humidity in your air at times. Yeah. So that's a great, great tool because... Um, We've considered getting like a, a reefer unit or a refrigeration unit to create a butcher shop out here and, and give us the perfect conditions. But that's really nice nice to know that you can do it in, in a much more controlled environment as well. And you guys have that going on. It started May 9th that the cave went on sale, correct? Yep, May 9th. And we're selling it through Kickstarter, which is a... Um, a crowdsourcing website. So um, this is a new product for us that we're just putting out in the market. We're super excited about it. And um, by selling it on Kickstarter, we're able to get uh, people to uh, do pre-sales so that we can fund uh, the molds that we're going to use to uh, make the housing unit for the cave and then also uh, do bulk purchase orders for, you know, for our first run. Yeah, and you're also going to be able to have other options as well. It's just buying the unit. You're going to have other rewards. Okay. We've got beer steins. Um, uh, we, yeah, if, if you're interested just in learning about these things, we're also offering just for $8. There's um, three different e-books for learning how to brew beer, make cheese, and dry cure meat. Mm -hmm. So, oh, very um, awesome. yeah, we're, we're just putting up a whole bunch of things that we're excited about. We thought... Um, we'd be interested in and other people would be interested in. Yeah, so you can search for us at Swiss Hills Ferments on Kickstarter webpage, or you can go to our website, and we'll, we have a link on there as well that will redirect you to our our webpage on Kickstarter. Excellent. So you can do both diff, both options there. Um, okay. Great. So our website our website is SwissHillsFerments.com, and then the unit we're selling is called The Cave, so you can search for either of those things. Okay, yeah. great. And the the direct link to the Kickstarter page is also SwissHillsForMens.com slash Kickstarter? Yeah, okay. yeah. That will get you directly to our Kickstarter page. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we will definitely encourage our audience to be checking that out, and we will be checking that out. And it's funny that you said about the ebooks because all this time as we're talking, I'm thinking you guys should have books because there's so much great <laughs> information. And and everybody's always looking for the recipes on how to make things and how to get started fermenting. And it's funny how you know people have their to do list, but 
you know, when it's something new, they're so fearful of it. Like you said, you started with your girlfriend and I had a couple friends teach, you know, give me some cheese recipes too. And that's what got me started. And it's just, it's addicting. And that certainly is proof when you say you've got containers all over your counters and through your house. Cause it's just, you start one thing and you got to like continue experimenting with all the rest. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's like I have all of these project bookmarks that we want to do. <laughs> and it's just a matter of time putting them all in. So Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, especially if you have access to goats or sheep or, or cows. Yes. No one, for yeah, for their milk. I mean, if, you, if you're producing three gallons of milk uh, a day or, or whatever else you're getting from your cow, you can't drink, well, they're going to be pretty bulky by the end of the day if you drink three gallons of milk. So <laughs> you got, you got to find some other use for it. Exactly. We had milk goats, yeah. and I am so missing them. We had, we had to uh, get rid of them due to my health conditions. So, because I just couldn't keep up milking them and taking care of them. But oh my gosh, their milk was so creamy and so good. And oh my gosh, I was like hoarding it because I had all these projects I wanted to use it for. We had a limited amount in the refrigerator you could drink because the rest was going to cheese or yogurt or. <laughs> Yeah, so I feel the same way. We we don't have any goats or cows or anything. And actually, when I started making cheese, I I thought in the back of my head, someday when I have cows, I'm just trained myself for when we have them, so I can do something that this, this <laughs> milk hasn't happened yet. But no, I feel the same way because we get uh, a couple gallons of raw milk from a farm just a little ways away from us. And I'm always thinking to myself, well, do I use it for this project or do I drink it? I don't know. It's so tasty. I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and speaking of goats, I mean, we, we actually had goat milk for a while there, and a lot of people have the misconception that goat tastes different than yeah. cow milk, and it, it really doesn't. It really, really doesn't. As long as there's not a ram around the the females, yeah. you know, you, you're not gonna get you're not gonna get any off flavors. It's gonna it's, it really tastes really good. Yeah, it's surprising. So, it's surprising. I've I've fooled a couple people here, you know, that would would ne you know they'd never drink it, and I had them drink it, and they couldn't believe how good it was. There's a couple tricks I had shared it in my previous podcast that when you're milking a goat, if you ch like uh, chill it while you're milking it by having an ice pack in the bucket, or you flash freeze it, just put it in the freezer for a little while and really cool it fast, you eliminate that goaty taste. And it also depends on what you're feeding them sometimes too. We were doing a lot of alfalfa and um, molasses feed and that seemed to really enhance the flavor of their milk a lot for us too. But it is it is a very big misconception. My, my one uncle used to um, have goats and every time we'd eat any of his stuff it was just really goaty tasting and my my thoughts are just that they didn't chill it fast enough or they didn't chill it right away that it got that way so that's one of the tricks but oh it's such good <laughs> stuff <laughs> yeah that's awesome we're gonna have to try that when we get goats yeah. someday 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 yeah. we'll have goats yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we are running out of time here, but I wanted to leave the floor open to you guys to maybe give some words of encouragement to my audience as far as how can they get started, what are some things, you know, that you would recommend. Uh, you know, everybody's always afraid to, to try something new. So do you have some words of advice? Well, I feel a little bit like if we can do this, that anyone can. <laughs> I mean, we don't have a farm. We don't. We. I mean, we were butchering a pig in our garage, honestly. Oh yeah. <laughs> we had people coming up and asking us if we had a garage sale going on because we moved everything out of our garage to make space for it. <laughs> but anyway, so I mean, I would say, as you know, as long as you are, you know, following some instructions and you have, you know some type of guide in front of you, it, these things are not that hard to do. You know, they might be new, but, um, you know, the steps for brewing beer is, you know, a lot of boiling water, which anyone can do, or the steps for dry curing meat is, you know, a lot of just putting salt on meat and letting it hang up to dry. I mean, th these things are not that difficult as long as you have um, the right equipment and as long as you have a good recipe and, it's 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 not that hard. You can do it. Yeah, I think to start off, start off small. You know, choose choose something that you really enjoy doing. Whether it's drinking beer, making your own beer. Uh, <laughs> that's normally how a lot of home brewers get started. <laughs> um, 
you know, for the cheese making, just is it takes a couple of pots and a little bit of knowledge and some mm-hmm. some recipes, and you're good, you're good to go. And you know, the butchering, a lot of guys hunt, and so with that comes meat that you're throwing in the freezer or butchering up, and most guys just cut it into what roast steaks and grind up most of it. Yep. When in reality, you could probably reserve some of that and try to do some sausages. You know, whether that's broth or maybe it's maybe getting a little wild and going for a salami and start smoking um, those salamis and then maybe adding some uh, culture, fermentation to it. Just just go slow. But I would suggest just, just expanding your skill set yeah. a little bit, you know, just not going with the norm and, and try something new, try something else. Have fun with it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome advice. And and so true. And I'm definitely going to be going to your website looking for that salami recipe. <laughs> but I I really appreciate you guys taking the time to join me today. And uh, I encourage everyone to definitely check out their website. I was scouring some of their other uh, recipes on there. And I encourage you to check them out. And it's like she's like, like Karen said, if you have a good recipe to start with, you're already on a right foot. And there's so much information out there on the internet. Sometimes it's hard to find that good recipe. So that's why I thought it was imperative to have Swiss Hills Ferments join me so that they could share this with you because it's really good to have someone also when you have questions to be able to refer to. So I highly recommend them and, um, encourage you to check them out and also check out their cave. I'm very anxious to uh, consider using something like that out here as well to uh, supplement our smokehouse. So, um, But thank you so much for joining us and um, I wish you guys the best of luck with the cave and, and the things that you have going. But thank you for sharing all the details and you will definitely be hearing from me a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. You know, it was really fun talking with you about this. Absolutely. Yeah, we always love talking fermentation with, with anyone, so anytime we get to it, it's exciting for us. So thanks for having us. Oh, absolutely. And if you guys have more going on, a new book coming out, and different things up ahead, don't be afraid to look me up. We'll be glad to have you back on. But everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And until our next show, you guys take care, and God bless. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where you will learn something new every week. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to join us at treyerwilderness.com. And be sure to connect with us on iTunes. Remember, your reviews on iTunes are very important to us and help us reach more people just like you. 